Welcome to the Sanity Project podcast, the place for internet technology professionals whose work-life balance plan has imploded. We are here to provide solutions that will help the IT pro live a sane, healthy, and prosperous life. Here's your host, Joanne Victoria. Hi, I'm Joanne Victoria, and I am the host of the Sanity Project podcast. I partner with IT professionals in telecommunications, technology, entertainment, and mass media industries whose work-life balance plan has imploded, and who want more success, more confidence, more fun, and more inner peace. The Sanity Project podcast is a platform for experts in the personal development and IT communities to share their wisdom expertise and solutions that will help the IT professional live a sane, healthy, and prosperous life. Our guest today is going to help us in two specific areas, but first let me introduce him. Our guest today is Dr. Cleet Bulash, and Dr. Bulash is a retired Ohio school superintendent and associate professor emeritus at the University of West Georgia. He is the author of numerous articles in educational journals and is co-author of two books, the first one being School Climate and Culture Vis-a-Vis Student Learning, Keys to Collaborative Problem Solving and Responsibility. The second book is Enhancing a High-Performing School Culture and Climate, New Insights for Improving Schools. The second book focuses on human relations problems that interfere with creating a positive school culture and climate poor interpersonal communications, and inability to cope with conflict. Now, I know some of you are asking, why am I having a professor emeritus on the show when this is about IT pros? Well, the truth of the matter is we start learning at a young age, and the topics that Dr. Bulash is going to discuss with us today are very significant as far as grown-ups in the workplace. And what we're going to talk about today is our, where are my notes? Oh, there we are. Five interpersonal communication skills. And interpersonal communication starts when you're born. And we're going to talk about five conflict management styles. So if you've got Dr. Bulash in your headlights right now, now you know why he is here. And this is the second time he's been here because I asked him back because he has so much information and so much content that he needs to share with you listeners. So Dr. Bulash, welcome and talk to us about why the interpersonal commission indicate. All right, start over again, Joanne. Why interpersonal communication skills are important in our society. Okay. I wrote about schools, but this applies to any organization. It applies to any family, any church, any group that works together. Communication occurs all the time, verbal and nonverbal. Every minute of every day when you interact with other people, communication takes place. It's unfortunate that in many organizations, no one has thought about how does communication occur. In many cases, it's just automatic. It's what happens. Okay. But if you analyze it, there are some skills that really improve how communication occurs. The first skill that's very important when dealing with a conflict, when dealing with a problem, when dealing with your kids, when dealing with your anybody is paraphrasing. And I'm sure you, you're familiar with that, Joanne. Yes, I am. Uh, and you've used, you use it frequently, don't you? Well, I do in the sense it's, it's like when someone is speaking to me and they're speaking their own language or their own form of the language, and I will sometimes say, what I hear you saying is dot, dot, dot. And that's they'll, correct. And they'll either you, say, oh, no, no, that's not what I meant. Yeah, that is precisely why it is used, because when people say something, what they, what people hear is not what was meant, or sometimes people say things and they didn't say what they, they meant. Um, so when you paraphrase, you, you tell in your own words what you think you heard. So people who are listening sometimes don't hear what was said. And sometimes the people who are saying it 
didn't say what they meant to say. So paraphrasing clears that up. But it does a lot of other things in human relations. When you paraphrase, it says, I'm listening to you. I care about you. I want to make sure. So whatever is going on, if it's a conflict, paraphrasing de-escalates it because it says the relationship is very important for you and you are there working with this person. So it's a we, it's a we thing, paraphrasing. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. So we get to the second one, which is one I use throughout my career, particularly as an assistant principal. It was behavior description. Behavior description is where you describe exactly the behavior that you saw. Uh, I'll give you an example I used with my granddaughter on our way to uh, her graduation at Auburn nursing Mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. She's driving in the left-hand lane, Mm. the high-speed lane. And I said, Bianca, do you realize that you're driving in the high-speed lane? Yeah, Grandpa, I know. Do you know that when police use their radar gun, which lane do they focus on? I don't know. (laughs) Do you you think they focus on the high-speed lane or the other lane? She says, probably the high-speed lane. I said, yeah. She says, oh, okay. And she moves over. Now, if I had said, Bianca, stop driving in the high-speed lane, she would say, why? What's wrong with that? Right. It's smooth over here. I like it over here. And off we go with, you know, a conflict starting. So behavior description always throws behavior description lacks judgment. There's no judgment. You just describe the behavior. Uh, like it, let's say your kid is out on a hot date, curfews at um, 12 o'clock and he comes in at 12.15. And you say, son, you just came in at 12, 15, 15 minutes after curfew. Boom. Drop it right there. So you you want the other person to judge the action. So behavior description allows that to happen. Right. Um, Whereas the judgment, you're driving too fast. That's a judgment. Right. That was a stupid thing to say. Judgment. Right. And on and on. I never saw a shirt that was that ugly. <laughs> uh, and on and on with what people normally do. Sure. When they see a behavior, they judge it. And they tell the other person what they judged it to mean. Mm-hmm. And that gets resistance and defensiveness. The five basic communication skills are designed to reduce defensiveness. Defensiveness shuts off communication. When you allow the other person to make the judgment, it opens up communication. Let's go to the third one, describing feelings, okay? I screwed up on that on the way to Auburn. and My daughter was driving in the high-speed lane again in town, and I said, Will you slow down? Oh. And she says, what do you mean? I'm going the speed limit. I said, I said, well, you don't. We've got an hour and a half to go. We don't need to go that fast. And we get into it. And I says, Bianca, don't argue with me. Ooh. And I should have said, Bianca, the way you're driving is scaring me. Right. Plop. And she would have said, what do you mean? I says, well, you're in the high-speed lane. we got plenty of time. How about just slowing down? And she would have done that without getting angry. Um, So when you describe your feelings, again, you throw the ball into the other person's court, and they will react to your feelings, not your judgment. Right. Okay. Do you want to go on any more on that one or what? No, this one you is okay really, with that. Yeah, I'm I'm liking this one here. Describe your feelings. It's uh, I've been there myself with my own daughter, and it's you know holding on to the handlebar and <laughs> as a passenger, and uh, it's, it's like 
it's just, you, you know, and, and then, of course, if I don't say anything and I'm just holding on to the handlebar, she even takes that as a judgment. So yeah, can't, can't win for trying. But um, I understand. Yeah, when, when our feelings are in play, it is normal human nature to say something to the other person who is causing your feelings. It's normal to make a judgment. Mm-hmm. You're driving too fast. Um, that was a that that was a stupid thing to do. Right. Rather than what you just did has really upset me. Oh, what did I do? Right. See, it's open. <clears throat> you go from conflict to conversation. Right. Right. Now, perception checking is the fourth basic skill. And it's a very important skill, and and I know with your career, you've used it with your books you've written. You see something, you see, our eyes are always registering nonverbal behavior, right? Right. You look at somebody, and you see that their arms are crossed, and you make a judgment. You see that their legs are crossed, and you make a judgment. You see a frown on their face, and you make a judgment. But how do you know? that your judgment is correct. You really don't know. No. I'll give you an example. I'm sitting with the teachers. I'm the superintendent in the lunchroom around the table, and we're talking, and one teacher gets this grimace on her face. And I says, Candace, did I say something that upset you? She says, oh, no, I got a pee in my throat. Um, <laughs> so, and that's a true story. Um Perception checking is when you see something and you have a perception, if it's important, you need to check it out. You need to tell the other person what you perceived. And it's just called a perception check. You ask them if what you perceived is correct. And they say, yeah, that really upset me. And and the comeback would be, well, I'm sorry that I have set you, what could I have done that would have made that better? You see, it opens up communication. Whereas if you just make the judgment, it it doesn't help the communication. And if your judgment is wrong, it's a mistake. Right. Okay. It's those people um, who, who just talked about body language years ago and everybody has subscribed to whatever they said, i.e. when somebody's arms are crossed and their legs are folded, they're resistant and they don't want to hear from you rather than just being a comfortable way for them to sit. Yeah. I mean, everybody's got their own ways and it, it's, we, it's difficult um, for us to think we can continue judging people by the way they cross their arms or handle any parts of their body that don't make sense to us or we were told means X, Y, and Z or A, B, and C. So, Yeah, that's correct. It's crazy. But President Trump's nonverbal is amazing. Um, you watch him with his handshake. The first time he shook hands with Putin, his hand was underneath. Putin's was on top. That's acquiescence. It's it's it it's not competitive at all. It's acquiescent when you do that handshake. Most of the time, his handshake is right side up, you know, right alongside. It's equal. Sure, we are equal. When your hands on top, you're saying I'm in control. He allowed Putin to have his hand on top, or purposely put his underneath to make him feel better. I, but yeah, anyway, I don't think he makes mistakes. <laughs> I don't well, anyway think, you know the I, fifth yeah the, the fifth communication skill is extremely important how do you get good feedback about your leadership about what you're doing and then how do you give feedback that's uh chapter one in book two this five basic communication skills because that is the most serious problem in all organizations it's how communication occurs because it depends on whether that creates a defensive culture or an open, harmonious culture, okay? It depends. It creates levels of openness and trust. All of the four skills that we've talked about so far create openness. Openness, 
is the sine qua non of trust. If there is an openness, trust does not occur. If there is an openness and trust in an organization or in a relationship, it's dysfunctional. Okay, here's the fifth communication skill, giving and receiving feedback. We'll talk about receiving feedback first. I'm going to share two techniques I have used all through my career. One is called the expectations diagnosis. You are the leader, and you could be the new leader or the leader who's been there for five or six years. You go to the people you are leading, and you say, what do you expect of me as your superintendent, as your principal, as your supervisor, as your whatever, as your minister? What do you expect of me? They say, you're asking us what we expect? And I say, yeah, I'd like to know what you expect. I'm going to give you three three by five cards. On each card, I want you to write one behavior that you expect of me as your leader. They say, wow. They usually tell us what they expect, and you want us to tell you what you expect? Yeah, I'd like to know. So you get the three-by-five cards, and you quickly sort them into common piles, and you paraphrase what's in each pile, and you go back to them, and you say, here is what you said you expect of me as your leader, and I am going to try to meet those expectations. Here's one that I may have some difficulty with, and you explain. So what you've done there is you have said, I am here to serve you. I'm your leader, but I am your servant. I'm listening to you. I trust you. I am open with you. I care about you. See, you're building the relationship there. Right. Is that, so you're getting feedback from them on what they expect. Now, somewhere down the road, that may be at the end of a month or six months, or in, me, in my case, I did it at the end of every school year. I went to all the people. And I said, Dr. Bulock is a good school superintendent because, complete that sentence as many times as you wish. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bulock would be a better superintendent if, complete that sentence as many times as you wish. Now, this is called force field analysis. It goes back to Kurt Lewin in the 50s. All of your readers can look up force field analysis and you'll get a very complex explanation of the entire process. This is a the most simplistic process for doing it. Two sentences. Forces for is good because would be better if forces against. You're going to get feedback on how you came across during that year. It's honest feedback, too. Um, valid feedback. Now, you got people who are going to love you and they're going to just tell you all the great things that you've done and none that you did bad. Throw those away. You're going to have people who cut you. Mm. They don't have anything good to say about you. Throw those away. Mm -hmm. And you've got the people who are looking at you through the right lens. They're seeing what you do good. They're seeing what you could do better. So you look at those and you pick out a improvement plan for what you're going to do the following year. Are you going to uh, power up on some of the things you've done well? Or are you going to address some of the things you could do better? But it gets you valid feedback from normally as a school superintendent, that was the only way I could get valid feedback because the board members all had access to grind in one way or another. They wanted something from me. And they, the feedback I got from board members many times did not help at all. Um, <clears throat> when I was a teacher, the feedback I got from principals did not help because they don't really know you. Right. The people who know you are the people who work for you every day. Right. When I was a teacher, the kids, the students did that on me. The feedback I got after seven years, I was one of the best teachers in that school. We went from eight classes of German to 25 in a high school. Hmm. All of us using the same technique. One and a half teachers to five teachers using that technique. The kids loved us. But anyway, those are the five basic communication skills. Now, receive, uh, giving feedback, I've got 10. There are 10 things that need to be considered when you give feedback. 
uh, giving overload is probably the worst uh, problem. Uh, <clears throat> how receptive is the person that you want to give feedback to? So you say, I saw something you did the other day. Would you like to hear about it? So you've got to prompt. you got to find out if they are receptive to whatever it is you want to give feedback about. Um, you know, with my, with my daughter, I should have, I should have said, I can give you some suggestions on how to improve your driving. Would you like to hear it? Nine times out of 10, they're going to say, yeah, yeah, I'd like to hear it. Well, now the door is open. But when I just butt in and tell them what I think about their driving, they don't want to hear it. Right. Um, so finding, making sure they're receptive is the first thing you should do when you want to give feedback. And of course, the uh, nonverbal behavior between you and the other person is very important too. If you're like Trump with your arms closed, and that's his natural style, I don't mm. think he's really defensive when he does that. That's no. just his natural style. But if the other person is sitting over there with their arms closed across their chest and their knee is tucked up tight against their stomach, you know they're not open. So how do you get them to relax and and uh, um, be receptive to what it is you're going to say? That's very important. So that's the number one thing you've got to try to do when you're giving feedback, getting them to relax and getting them to be open. If there's not there, you, they aren't going to hear anything you're going to say. Um, of course, overload, um, giving them feedback um, when it's current, not something that happened last month, or but, last you know, year something that is recent. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's gotta be something that's recent. Yeah. Otherwise, it's so, not, yeah, it has to be relevant. Yeah. And then I would always say, how do you feel about that? You know, when, when I give them feedback, I say, how do you feel about that? Are you okay with what I said? Perception check. Um, that's about it on the five basic communication skills. Okay. Well, I don't know how much time we have left. Uh, we have five conflict management styles, which I think our listeners would really want. So if we can highlight I'll them. I'll run through those real fast. Yeah, let's How much highlight. time we got? Well, we'll make time. Uh, okay. Because this is important because conflict management, nobody knows how to manage conflict in the in the universe, let alone in corporations that are using our <laughs> dollars and their dollars to run the world. So their their style of conflict is to shame, blame, fire, transfer. It's all negative. Yep, you're right. Um, okay, here we go. Each conflict management style has a win or a lose. Two people in a conflict, one is going to win, one is going to lose. There's a win or lose in all of them, okay? Here we go. Uh, competitive. That's Mr. Trump, President Trump. Highly competitive. I win, you lose. Look what he did to the, all the people who were contestants to be the president, okay? Yeah. He took them all on, he won. With the news media, I'm going to win. You guys, you fake media, you guys are going to lose. I'm going to destroy CNN and on and on with Megyn Kelly and on and on. I right. win, you lose. Uh, that's his preferred style, but it's not his only style. With Kim Jong, the North Korean leader, he was collaborative, and that is lose-lose. He is willing to give Kim some things that he wants to make his country great again. In return, Kim has to give up his nuclear program, lose-lose. That's the cooperative style. It is the most frequent one used in negotiations, and of course, he is a great negotiator. Mm -hmm. So um, when he comes up with uh, this tariff, I'm going to raise tariff on steel and aluminum 20%, he's prepared to lose. He's not. He's not prepared to stay at 20%. That's where he's starting. Mm -hmm. And he does that, huh? Yep. 
I'm list, I'm I'm with you. I'm taking okay. notes because this is important. <laughs> and then you get to um, uh, the win-win style, which is the preferred style. It is the hardest style. It takes the longest, but it's the win-win. You find out what both parties want, and you figure out how to get there. Mm-hmm. As parents with your kids, that is the most important style. So how do you get your kids to do what they're supposed to do and you get what you want out of the deal. Um, That's very important. Uh, There is a manuscript I wrote on that way back when. It's probably on the web somewhere on collective bargaining, Mm -hmm. the win-win method. Uh, You might get on there and look up Bulock and collective bargaining and it might still be on the web somewhere. Anyway, the, uh, here's, here's one that, uh, President Obama used with his foreign relations. It's called accommodation. That's the fourth style. It's I lose, you win. The U.S. loses, they win. With Iran, the $150 billion for one uh, prisoner. Yeah. What a, you know, <laughs> we lost that one big time. And yeah, there's more drama behind these decisions, that's for sure. Yeah. Then there's the Cuba one. What did we get out of that? Nothing. Less than then nothing. Then there's the, uh, uh, pr- the, cl- the Paris Climate Accord. What did we get out of that? Nothing. Uh, we gave the ship away, and China didn't have to comply with anything for the next 10 years. And we had to comply immediately. Then there's the uh, Bo Bergdahl. One prisoner for five of theirs. He gave the ship away. Uh, When it comes to foreign relations, he gave the ship away. But when it came to working with Congress, he was highly competitive. You guys, I don't care what you do. I got this pen here. I got the executive order. I'm going to do what I want to do. I got this phone on my desk. You guys go screw yourself. So that's the the four basic conflict management styles. Competitive, win-lose, collaborative, win-win. Cooperative, cooperation, lose-lose, accommodate, I lose, you win. Many parents are too accommodating to their kids. They lose and the kids win. And you go to Walmart and look at how many parents accommodate their kids, and it's bad. The parents are losing. The kids get what they want. Anyway, then you come to avoidance. That is the most important style. When should you avoid a conflict and when should you take it on? Many times, it took me many years to realize that I couldn't solve all the conflicts and that avoiding them sometimes is the best thing to do. There are four ways to avoid a conflict, okay? Here's number one. A negative assertion, okay? You do something stupid and somebody calls you on it and you say, Oh, God, that was the stupidest thing I ever did. I should not have done that. When, uh, what's his name, Billy, what was that young reporter? They were talking about how he treats women. He says, yeah, you can just reach your arm and grab them. Right. Remember that one? Yes, I do. He should have said, oh, God, that was the stupidest thing I ever said. I don't know what caused me to be that stupid. I should never have said that. That is not me. Yeah, that was him because he was arrogant. Was yeah. Billy Bush. He because- said, "He said, where did you get that? Oh, huh? I did. I didn't. You know, he just he didn't t- he didn't avoid it. So negative inquiry is the second way to avoid a conflict. You do something stupid. Let's suppose you do something stupid. You say, "Oh God, what could I have done that would have made that better?" Negative inquiry. Negative assertion, you own it. Negative inquiry, you own it, but you open it up and you say, oh, what could I have done that would have made that better? So you're getting feedback. See, you are reducing, the conflict is automatically reduced right there. Got it. When you say, throw it back to them and say, tell me what I should have done there. Because, you know, I don't want to do that again. Okay. Then you get to, uh, one called, let's say somebody insults you, okay? Uh, that was the stupidest thing 
you could have done. And you could say, well, you could say that. See what I mean? You fog it. No matter what people, no matter how people insult you, you just fog it. You say, well, that could be, that might have been, that might be possible. You could say that. You never agree with the insult. You, you fog it. You kind of plop it. Okay. Yeah, it's it's diluted here. It's diluted. D i l u t e d, uh, not d e l u d e d, or maybe yeah, that as right. well. But it's yeah, uh, just go. It's it's possible. Anything can happen. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm drawing a blank right now on the. Um, let me let me turn the speaker on here for a second, and go to chapter two in my book. And I'll tell you the fourth way to avoid a conflict. The broken record. Oh, the broken record. Okay. Let's suppose your kid comes home from school from a date and the curfew is at 12 o'clock and they're in at 1230. Okay. Son, curfew is 12 o'clock and you came in at 1230. But dad. We really had this thing going between us, my date and I. Son, curfew is 12 o'clock. You came home at 12.30. But, Dad, you don't understand. We really were getting it on. I mean, we really had this. Son, curfew is 12 o'clock. You came in at 12.30. No matter what the kid says, you broken record it. And I have done that technique many times as a principal, a teacher who frequently comes in after they're supposed to be in, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> one of the things, when I went to the uh, teachers and I said, what do you expect of me as your principal? They already said, the people who come in late, we want you to, to talk to them, not to all of us. Ah. So when they came in late, I would say, you're supposed to be clock in at 7.30. But I, my kid... Kurt, clock in at 7.30. But you don't clock in at 7.30. No matter what they say, clock in at 7.30. I've broken record it. You just never give them an inch on that because once you listen to what they say, it ain't gonna, it's not going to end. So the four ways to avoid a conflict, broken record, fogging, negative assertion, and negative inquiry. That's chapter two in book two. And of course, there's um, a lot more there about when you have to deal with a conflict, how do you confront them? Do you do it diplomatically? Do you do it gentle? Do you do it firm? And what's the difference between those three ways? Um, so there's a whole chapter on uh, how to deal with conflict there, and it's pretty generic. You can use it in any. And if you like, I can uh, attach that chapter to a, an email so you can read it. Sure, you but, do that, and then what I will do also is put it on your website page, your page that will be on my website so that people can access that. Is that okay for you? Sure. Okay. Um, we have so much information. I have got to reread my notes again, 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 and um, look at, listen to the recording, but I want... I don't know why I'm getting feedback on myself, but I hear it. Uh, so I want to ask the listeners, number one, this is, we're here for you guys. So number one, share this podcast with anyone you know, as well as re-listen to it over and over again in case you missed something. And I'm sure with Dr. Bulash, because he has so much deep content, you'll have to listen to it again. Number two, please give this podcast and our guest, Dr. Cleet Bulosh, a five-star review on iTunes, please. Number three, go to my website, askjoannevictoria.com, and click on products and check out my latest self-study program called the Be Your Authentic Self program. It's a system you complete by yourself in your own time. It includes a suite of PDFs, audios, and videos for $297, which would be cheap if it were 10 times that price, actually. If you have any questions about this podcast or anything else, please email me at ask 
joannevictoria at gmail.com. And if there is something that you want to talk to Dr. Bulash about personally, you can email him at cbulach at comcast.net. I hope everybody has that. Do you have any final thoughts, Cleet? No, always enjoy being on your show. Well, thank you. It's always fun interacting with you. I think we'll do it again in a few months, and we'll find something else that our audience needs to know because this is just great information, and I knew I could count on you again. So have a great day, everybody, and um, here we're off. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Sanity Project Podcast. Please go to AskJoanneVictoria.com and continue the conversation on my podcast page and get a free copy of my book, The True Self Handbook, a guide to transform your life. That's AskJoanneVictoria.com. Take care and thanks for being here.